is up everybody welcome back to another video in today's video we are back to once again talk a little bit about the upcoming 2022 nfl draft for the detroit lions but we're also going to specifically talk about this defense and where the lions need help now i know when i say that you're probably like, well everywhere but where the lions need help and where they may look to address some of those places that they need help in this year's draft so let's get it started the city's been been down and it found a way to get up and when you knock us down we're going to get up and on the way up we're going to bite a kneecap off all right and we're going to stand up and then it's going to take two more shots to knock us down we're going to take another hunk out of you before before long we're they going to be the last one standing welcome everybody to our video glad you guys are here i don't know if that intro was the best i don't know if that explained it the best but i'm not really sure how to explain this i'm not sure what the title is going to be but basically in today's video we're going to take a look a little bit at the lions defense from last season what the lions are bringing in the 2022 and where the lions specifically may look to add some help based on the history of the saints the rams the Jaguars, Brad Holmes, and Aubrey Pleasant coming from there. Of course, the Saints, because you have Dan Campbell and you have Aaron Glenn coming from there, now our defense coordinator. And today we're talking about this defense. And then a little bit of the Jaguars as well, because of Todd Walsh, who was at one point their defensive coordinator for about four seasons. He was also our defense, their defensive line coach. By the way, did you know Todd Walsh was the defensive line slash run game coordinator for the Jacksonville Jaguars for a few seasons? I actually didn't know that. I just found that out today. I never even noticed that. But I know we've talked a little about the Lions not really having like a a run game guy technically well he's been that label in the past so maybe he gets that label this season now that Anthony Lynn is no longer here but I really wanted to focus on this defense for the Detroit Lions because yes we need help offensively as well but I think defensively of course when you see where we were statistically defensively is a spot I, I mean Ryan loves to say it we need some playmakers defensively and how can the Lions look to address that based on how we've seen maybe the Rams go about it how the Saints have went about it but also based on the numbers where the Lions should be looking this offseason so this is just a continued deep dive into this instead of just going through and ranking it I thought we'd really take a deep dive on some extra advanced statistics metrics all that kind of fun stuff and I love doing this because it may be kind of all over the place and I find new statistics all the time which I think is pretty sweet you could say the Detroit Lions free agency period has been relatively quiet they haven't made a ton of external splash signings but they have re-signed a lot of their players they've made some moves defensively they've also re-signed a lot of their players and brad holmes addressed this talking about the re-signings that they've had so far he said number one a lot of these guys wanted to come back which was a huge part of it plus number two a lot of these players they earn contracts and number three they did compare the players that they re-signed to other players across the league and they just felt like you know the re-signings that they did make were the best situation for them but like he said when these guys become unrestricted free agents or restricted free agents they're available to to everyone at that point so even though they were with you the past season they're available to everybody everybody can get involved but like a lot of these players have said they've had interest from other teams we don't know what the contracts they threw out were maybe ours were the best maybe they weren't and they just decided to come back who knows not a ton of external splashes however we shouldn't overlook those because you really never know what they're going to turn into i mean last off season you would argue we didn't really make any external splashes either defensively but a couple guys you know stood out and they made a name for themselves obviously charles harris comes to mind but who knows maybe there's a guy like that that the lions have already signed maybe that's my cues from Kansas City that's getting completely overlooked. Maybe that's a Jared Davis. I don't know. Maybe it's a Chris Board from Baltimore that just seems like he's getting no talk because Jared Davis is now here. Who knows? There could be that guy on the roster. But we know, as Red likes to say, the Lions do need some playmakers defensively. And overall, they have to improve defensively. And while I like what the Lions have done so far in free agency, the draft is where it's going to hit hard because it's going to be very important that the Lions land a lot of talent in the draft, not for just now, but also going forward because these are going to be the cornerstones of what the Lions are trying to build. They're putting a lot on these drafts. They're also doing well, I think, in free agency and trying to open up some needs. That way they don't have to force certain positions at certain spots. But at the same time, the draft is going to be extremely important. And the Lions right now are holding nine picks. If they trade back, they could really improve upon that nine number. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. But I try to dive into this a little bit more. As we get closer to this draft, a lot of things are going around. I feel like at one point there was like a peak of Malik Willis talk. It seemingly has died down a little bit after what he, uh, Brad Holmes said about Jared Goff. I don't believe it's going to happen. Uh, but now I feel like, you know, Kyle Hamilton, he's been getting a lot of talk for a while at the safety position. He's also still in play. So I wanted to dive into this a little bit deeper. And I, I will continue to as we get closer to the draft and just try to figure out maybe what direction the Lions would go with this. Where do they really need help? I mean, aside from just saying, well, they need help everywhere. Where do the Detroit Lions need help? And where may they look to focus in this year's draft based on what they've done in the past? Not necessarily the Lions, but where these guys have came from. 
Where did they go in the past in the draft to address some of those needs? So I think we'll start in the front and kind of work our way back. Let's start with the trenches. Let's start with the defensive line for the Lions. Last season, they hit it with a couple of picks there with Ali McNeil and Levi Onzerike. Those two guys are expected to be big pieces. Ali McNeil showed a lot of promise. Levi struggled, but those are two high draft picks. And I don't necessarily think the Lions are going to draft guys to like step on their toes, meaning I don't think their top pick will be an interior defensive lineman, but I definitely could see them addressing it again. And even if it is a pretty high pick, it's fine to have that rotation. Nick Williams is now a free agent. Michael Brockers is coming back. It's no sense to cut him for the season. I like having Michael Brockers. But like we saw with the Rams at one point, you end up do cutting cutting those guys, right? They ended up cutting Chris Long. So maybe Michael Brockers make it, makes it throughout his contract. Maybe he doesn't. Who knows? But you don't have Nick Williams coming back. It doesn't look like the Lions are going to sign a vet DT. Maybe they will. They've shown some interest in a guy like Arden Key, but he's more of a defensive end. But the Lions could continue to add to that. They could continue to add to that mix, put pressure on those guys, and just continue to add to that rotation and then you bump out to the defensive end position and this is where things get really interesting because now it all kind of comes together right we're talking about running a more four down defensive lineman next season to try to fit to our players strength and Campbell's talking about playing Levi is like a three technique but now he has the ability to play five and things like that like your three technique a majority of time based situations Aleem can play you know a shading over the center you know playing a one tech and then you got a guy like uh Romeo Okwara could play defensive end Charles Harris who's now been re-signed to play defensive end of course you have Romeo Okwara coming back and I was really trying to dive into what do these two players really bring to the table? I mean, aside from just saying, well, they're good good defensive ends, what do they bring to the table for the Lions? And where may the Lions look to improve this? You know, what do they bring? So when I look at a guy like Romeo Cora, we'd always coming off a serious injury, which definitely plays into it. They're hoping to have him at some capacity back for the training camp. We'll see where he's at. But Romeo Cora had that breakout season in 2020 before this Lions staff got here, but they decided to resign him. His cap at the first year was really low. After that, it spiked up. This season, it's $14.5 million, and he's not going anywhere this this year next year he could be moved on from but there'd still be a pretty nice amount of dead cap I think like seven million dollars so look at Romeo back in that 2020 season of course it was a different defense but when you look at him in a 2020 season one thing that I noticed is okay he was known for pass rush run defense was not his strength even in that great season run defense was nowhere near his strength but I think it's also important to mention that in that season a majority of his pass rushing project production most of the efficiency that he had as a pass rush top 10 in terms of like pressures from the defensive end position that year but where he made a lot of his production was playing at the left defensive end spot. He was much more productive from that spot versus the right defensive end position. Still productive, it was like 11%, but it was much more productive from the opposite side, which is going to get, a get, get to go against right tackles, which a lot of times your best tackle is your left tackle, especially in pass protection. So that's where a lot of his production came from. We know Romeo, you know, he was a solid run defender in the past, but he's never been like a dominant known for his run defense. And then on the opposite side, you know, let's just say as what we have right now, it will likely be Charles Harris who has been re-signed to his two-year $13 million deal, which is even better for us, about six and a half mil. Look at us. We were like right on the money with that. I, I literally think we did a video projecting that if we were going to re-sign Charles, we'd offer him two years, six and a half million per season. Literally what his deal is. That's insane. We were right on. I don't know how we did that. I think that's what we, or maybe it was three years. Either way, we were pretty darn close. His cap number is low for the season. He's pretty much locked in. But after this season, you know, it's one of those situations where his contract could be reworked. It could be basically turned into an extension for him. You could bring him back if he earns it this season. But at the same time, if he doesn't play well this year, he's not as productive as what you saw last season. You can end up moving on from a guy like Charles Harris. So it's still kind of in, you know, that boat. But when you look at Charles Harris, what I liked about Charles a lot last season was what he did as a run defender. We know he did some good things as a pass rusher and he probably would have been really beneficial for him to play alongside another great pass rusher. It was very inconsistent, the guys that he had across from him. But a lot of times across from his opponent's left tackle, not all the time, but he did that a lot. And what I think where he's shined is what he was able to do in terms of consistency against the run. The guy played in every game. He was sixth in the NFL in terms of ESPN's run stop rate. I wouldn't call him an elite pass rusher last season. You know, there were certain games where, like I always pointed out, like the Vikings, for example, they had a guard playing tackle. Yeah, he had a good game there, but it also wasn't like their normal tackle. There were certain games where he flashed, which is the case with a lot of pass rushers. And I wouldn't go out and say like he was a consistently dominant pass rusher last season. It was good. If you go by profile reference, he had like 34 pressures, which is good. Like I always say, one more than Hassan Reddick did in one more game. If you look at player profilers, they had Charles Harris with 26 pressures, which would be 35th in the National Football League, which again, it's not outstanding. He was reliable. He was consistent because he played in every game. And I thought he was good against a run for us. And he showed some ability to drop and things like that, play in that versatile style, but also be able to play with his hand in the dirt like the Lions may look to do more next season. Look at some of the advanced statistics like pass rush win rate last season for the Detroit Lions. And I like this because it kind of takes out the passing aspect a little bit. You can never 
really be perfect with this, uh, but basically what it does is how often a pass rusher is able to beat his block within two and a half seconds. So sacks, they can be a little bit skewed because if you're doing really well in coverage, they can't find the open. There has been a lot of coverage sacks out there. And I thought with Patricia, we had a lot of coverage sacks, more than just normal sacks, a lot of coverage sacks. This kind of takes it out. When you look at where the Lions ranked last season, unfortunately, they ranked 31st in the National Football League, only 33%. That's not very good. Now, when you look at where Brad Holmes is coming from, of course, I bet you could guess the LA Rams, they were first in National Football League at 53%. Over half the time they were winning those, which is insane. Aaron Donald, of course, has a lot to do with it because he's always first in his category on his own. But they obviously had a lot of help there as well. For the Lions, this was actually lower than it was the year before. A lot, big part of that, I believe, is because of where the Lions were at. They lost a lot of players. They lost Romeo. They didn't have Trey very much. So really, your top two guys coming into here were not there. And according to player profilers, Romeo Core in the four games that he played had nine pressures, which on pace, right, four, you had nine in four games. On pace, it would have been about 36 as a whole. Then you look at the run-stopping side of, th side of things. The Lions last season was were a little bit better here, according to ESPN's run-stop win rate. They were 23rd in the NFL at 29%. Now, I could see how the Lions would be better here because while it wasn't perfect all season, there were some really bad games in there. There was also some good games in there against a team like the Rams, who only had 2.5 yards per carry pretty well against the Vikings. And in that game, they only allowed 3.7 yards per carry on 27 carries. So had three sacks in that game. The Green Bay Packers, the first time around, they only averaged 3.1 yards per carry against them. I mean, I wouldn't even say the Ravens killed us on the ground either. A lot of that was Lamar Jackson. So there were some solid games in there, but then there's also the games like Seattle where you gave up 265 rushing yards. Of course, that makes it a lot worse. That was the worst game I thought we played all season was against Seattle where you gave up 51 points, which is just ridiculous. Levi, Aleem, you know, these guys are going to, they're going to step up. I mean, they're really going to be counting on those guys to step up. I think when you take a look at third downs, you look at sacks and pass rush rate, and you take a look at quarterback kids and even interceptions, I think it's also important to take a look at how many opportunities did he have defensively. While the Lions weren't efficiently great on third down, they give him a very high third down conversion rate, about 45%. Also, some of that has to do with how far is actually the third down. It also set up how many opportunities. The Lions didn't have too many opportunities on third down defensively. I believe they were the fifth lowest in the National Football League. But I was able to find this statistics site that took a look at how efficient you were on first down, second down, and third down defensively versus the run and the pass. First down, were you allowing more or less than 40% of the yards that needed to be gained on first down? If you allowed less, then that was a win. If you allowed more, then that was a loss. If it was first and 10, you gave up five yards on a run play. All right, you lost that round. If you gave up, however, three yards on a run play, you won that round. On second down, it's 60% of the yards. And then on third down, it's being able to convert on third down, no matter how far you, how far away that you are. So if that's third and one, third and three, whether that's run or pass, and kind of the efficiency behind that, it's just a a little bit of a deeper way to look at it. Take a look at the Detroit Lions on the season, taking a look at that those efficiency rankings. On the season on first down, against the run, they were 51% on efficiency. So allowing basically 40% or less amount of the yards needed to be gained on first down. That was 23rd in the NFL, and they were 20th in the NFL on first down on pass defense efficiency. That's a little bit better. Still both below average, but a little bit better. On second down, they were 25th in the National Football League on run defense efficiency, and they were 19th in the NFL on pass defense efficiency. So a little bit better against the pass on first and second down. However, on third down, this is where things go a little bit bad because against the pass, 42%. So basically 42% of the time that teams passed it against them on third down, they were converting, which was 30th in the NFL. Now when teams were running it on third down, it was 53%, which would be like, well, why is that more? It's probably because it's a short down situation. Lions only allowed 53% there, which was 17. So that was much better. But 42% of the time on third down when teams passed against them, they were picking up first down. I think what makes those statistics a little more concerning is when you see how much teams did certain things against us. For example, on first down, teams ran the ball 290 times, which was the second most in the National Football League, versus only passing it 203 times, which was the 29th most in the National Football League. So teams preferred to run the ball against us way more than they passed it. It was one of the highest in the NFL, which is a little bit concerning. Now, one thing that can play into this, of course, is situation if we're down which happened you know a few too many times last season then of course that could skew that number a little bit that is true however even if you just take a look at the first half stats just first and second quarter team still ran the ball 135 times against us which would have been seventh most in national football league so yes a little bit less but still seventh most to only 111 pass attempts against us which was 23rd most in the national football league so teams still preferred to run the ball against us on first down even in the first second quarters a little bit pulled back because it can be skewed a little bit because we did trail a little bit which kind of skews those numbers up but 
still, they prefer to run the ball against us. Same thing on second down. Second most rush attempts against at 176 versus passing attempts, which was 201 at 24th most in the National Football League. Being down can skew that, but you can see teams still prefer to run the ball on second down against us versus passing the ball against us. On third down, you can see teams only ran the ball 40 top five times against us, which really that dropped off, which was 29th in the Football League because we really struggled to get off the field against a pass. As you can see, we were 30th, like we said, uh, in efficiency. However, as you can see, the passing attempts also dropped as well because as a whole, we just didn't get many teams into too many third down situations, which can be a good thing if you're getting them off consistently, but we weren't. We were giving up 45% of the third downs that we were in. So it wasn't like we were consistently getting teams off the field. We weren't getting teams off the field on third down. Plus, at the same time, we didn't have very many third downs, which means there were a lot of situations like the Green Bay game where we didn't get teams off the field where they didn't even see third down. There were many drives that teams didn't even see third down and they still scored on us. That is a very big issue. Again, while they're skewed a little bit, very big issue. Teams like to run the ball on us on early down. The question is, how will the Lions address the defensive line? Let's say they didn't bring in another defensive line through free agency. Now, clearly they still have interest in doing so, right? They had a guy like Arden Key in for a visit after they signed Charles Harris back. So they still have interest clearly at in adding some help to that mix. The question is, when it hits the draft, if the Lions don't add any more help outside of what they've done so far, and I don't know if they will or not, how will the Lions look to address that position in the draft? Because even in free agency, there's not a lot of like top names for the defensive line. I mean, you could get some vets in there, maybe like a Sheldon Richardson. There's not that game-changer defensive lineman seemingly that's still out there in free agency. So how will the Lions look to address it? So, of course, I have to first look back at a team like the LA Rams, where Brad Holmes is coming from. When you take a look at the LA Rams, it's interesting. We know that they've really built through the defensive line. Defensive line heading into the 2014 season. And again, this was already one that looked at as one of the best, if not the best in the National Football League. They added on to that by drafting Aaron Donald, who was not their top pick that year in 2014. He was their second pick after Greg Robinson, but he's still first round pick. He was pick number 13 in that year's draft. They came in with Robert Quinn, who was the 14th pick in the draft, first round pick. Michael Brockers, who was acquired with the Washington trade where they got all those picks back from moving actually back from the two spots so that Washington can move up and take RG3. He was the 14th pick in the draft. Aaron Donald, the 13th pick in the draft. And next to him was Chris Long, who was the second pick in the draft. Unfortunately, not all those guys were healthy. But man, they stacked up the defensive line. At least since that time, that's continued to be the case. But it, that was the case before they got Aaron Donald, which is my point. Like, that was already what they were doing. And then they got Aaron Donald. Now, since they've gotten Aaron Donald, everything looks better on Aaron Donald because every year he is dominant. And unfortunately, the guy like Aaron Donald, it's not like you can look in the draft and be like, well, we'll go we get our version of Aaron Donald. There just isn't that guy. It's just Aaron Donald is Aaron Donald. He's one of one. He's ridiculous. It's insane. But it's that kind of defensive line that the LA Rams built. A team like the Lions, and you look at our front four that we have, we have Romeo in there. Of course, we also have Charles Harris, who was technically a first round pick. You have Levi and Aleem, and those two guys, specifically Levi, is going to be asked to step up big time. But just based on that alone, it would not shock you whatsoever if the Detroit Lions went in and said, hey, we're going to go drop a, draft the top defensive lineman with our first pick. Now, again, I don't believe that would be interior if they're going to do it. I think it'd be edge. Reason being, number one, Romeo Quora's run defense is not the best. You know, we've seen that. He's very productive pass rusher, but he's also coming off of an injury. Plus, Charles Harris, just based on his contract, he doesn't have to necessarily be a starter next season. It's great to have him. It really is, and he's versatile. He doesn't have to be a starter next season. And Charles Harris still wasn't the most dominant, consistent pass rusher that we've seen. So I would think it would be that edge position. So just based on what you've seen the Rams do, would not necessarily shock me if the Lions followed that similar path and they went out and got a pass rusher. Yeah, and I think when you look at all three teams, the Jaguars, the Saints, the Rams, all three of those teams put a pretty big emphasis on drafting and adding to the defensive line some way or another, putting help on the defensive line, getting a lot of talent there. I think the Rams first, as we said, they had four first round picks on the defensive line at one point and their defensive line has been a staple of that team for years going back before Aaron Donald. Then next up, I would say the Jacksonville Jaguars, Todd Walsh being the defensive line coach, then becoming the defense coordinator. They put a lot into that, including Josh Allen with the seventh pick in the draft. They also, of course, as we said before, he became the defensive coordinator, drafted Dante Fowler Jr. He was another first round pick. They also brought in Yannick Ngakwe. He was a third round pick, Dwayne Smoot. Now they had some players in the secondary for sure, but it was a lot about the defensive line. And then New Orleans Saints, maybe not investing as much as like the Rams, but they still did. Now, Cam Jordan's been there for a very long time, but then you have your Trey Hendrickson's, who was a third round pick. You have your Michael Davenport's, who was a first round pick, even though maybe that one didn't work out perfectly. He's still playing. I think he's coming off a nine sack season, though, so that's pretty good. He was a first round pick. So, all three of those teams, these guys are all coming from, they all did invest on the defensive line. It's just now which player 
in this class if the Lions do end up taking an edge with their top pick whether that's at two or through a trade back scenario which would be nice which edge do the Detroit Lions prefer and I really think that's going to be the story of the draft because there's a lot of different styles of pass rushers this year and I don't know if there's like a consensus list on how sure we are where certain edge rushers are going to end up going I mean the first three picks in the draft could all be pass rushers it might go even it could even go deeper than that who knows we know the value is there for those positions Chase Young was coming out of Ohio State we all kind of knew he was going going two to Washington. Maybe you were hoping as Lions fan, hey, he might fall to three, but we kind of knew he was going to go number two. I do believe Aiden Hutchinson will end up being the top pick in the draft, but after Aiden Hutchinson, where does this go? That's what's going to be interesting to see. You obviously talk about a guy like Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, I think if you're just taking on the field alone, I think it is a player that the Lions would have interest in. You take a look at his build. You take a look at pretty good length, a great first step. He needs to clean some things up, but he definitely seems to have a lot of upside as a pass rusher. I do think he's a little stiff in the lower body, but Kayvon is, of course, someone that's really interesting. Now, now, of course, all those reports are going out there. The Lions had seven staff members at his pro day. But it's important to keep in mind, first off, he didn't do drills at the Combine. So if you want to see him, you got to go to his pro day. And number two, teams always send guys to pro days. Now, it's not always, you know, like the guys like the general managers, like Brad Holmes, who was reportedly there and he was talking to Kayvon Thibodeau. But you're always sending guys to these things. That doesn't mean the Lions are going to draft him. It's just that he didn't do this at the Combine, number one, and, and you want to be able to see him. And then number two, he could end up being a top pick in this draft. So you have to go see these guys. And also, you want to talk to him I think that's a big part for him is all the off the field stuff how do you feel about him going forward how do you feel about him three years down the road how do you feel about his character off the field those are the things with Kayvon Thibodeau I mean of course the statement where he compared himself to a guy like Jadavian Clowney said Jadavian Clowney 2.0 you know that took a lot of people like why would you say Jadavian Clowney are you going to be happy with just being a top pick in this year's draft like what does that mean what do you mean Jadavian Clowney and yeah he's good on camera he's good on the mic he said he's been doing this media thing back since high school now one thing and I'll have to to continue to dive into some of his older film i do wonder a little bit about some of the production continued improvement in terms of production from year to year about cave on Thibodeau. that's something that does give me a little bit of hesitation you know even aside from the off-field stuff because that's the biggest thing that we don't know from the outside looking at is all the off the field stuff how people feel about him his work ethic his drive we don't know those things you can't take what the media says and be like yeah he's a hard worker because we just don't know those things we don't know the behind the scenes unfortunately but that's something that you really got to figure out with everybody, but definitely Kayvon Thibodeau. Now, another guy, now we're seeing the rumors that the Lions may be interested in. Again, we know that he became the betting odds favorite, and maybe this has something to do with that. We are seeing this rumor that was put out there. Don't know if it's true or not, because it's a rumor. But apparently a scout is saying that Trayvon Walker is looking like he's going to be a top five pick, and the Detroit Lions could very well be that team that takes Trayvon Walker. Now, I would definitely prefer to take Trayvon Walker with a trade back. I didn't have Trayvon Walker like number two on my edge rusher list I believe I had him at number four and again that's going to continue to change and update it's just a lot of because of the role that he played in last season and we've talked about that a lot the role that he played last year plus not even just a position that they lined him up because technically he did line up more than any other position outside of an offensive tackle over 300 of his snaps came there there are a lot of different defenses and so therefore you can be scattered all out on the field from playing a five technique a four eye on the front you play a three you can so you're really doing everything to just um, expand your resume and it's really it's really a good thing that you can do all of that play defensive end at the University of Georgia and if you can do play defensive end at the University of Georgia it means a lot but also because of who they were as a defensive front a lot of teams didn't go to like pure deep pass deep drop sets they were trying to get the ball out extremely quickly so even with maybe when they didn't get pressures there was still the impact of how great that defensive line was. It completely changed offenses where it was screens. It was get the ball out of your hands quickly because not just Trayvon Walker, but the entire defensive line was so dominant that teams would have to adjust their game plan going into games. Even aside from just the, where he was lined up all the time, there's also the fact that as a defensive front, it adjusted how offenses played. Now, why a guy like Trayvon Walker? Well, we know he's a freak. 6'5", 272, we know what he did at the Combine. And I don't think Brad Holmes, again, you know, he's told us this, they're not going to put all their stock because of what a guy does in the Combine. That doesn't make any sense. It's not a good way to draft players based on how they are athletically. Because if it was just about athletes, you know, any athlete would be a great pass rusher. But there is a skill to it. Talent, it's not something that you're just, oh, I'm a great athlete. I'm going to be a great pass rusher as well. And then you need that drive where the guy continues 
needs to get better, puts in that work outside of practice on his own, you know, puts in that grind. That's the kind of player that you need. And that's something the Lions will have to uh, learn about him. But great athlete. We know the combine was outstanding. 35 and a half inch, half inch arms, which are outstanding, which gives you a lot of upside, especially when you talk about setting the edge. A 4 5 on 40, which is a receiver time. 35 and a half inch vertical. And when he's coming out, people are talking about him as a, you know, 3 4 defensive end type. A guy that could play like a 3 4 defensive end role. That's what they look at Walker. And everybody talks about his versatility. We've seen him drop into coverage over 20 times. We saw him have a nice little pass breakup over the middle of the field. He's got that versatility. The guy can line up in the interior. He lined up in the B gap over 90 snaps. Kirby Smart said, you know, you can't replace a guy like Trayvon Walker. He, he's a once in a lifetime player. You can't just replace what Trayvon Walker did for Georgia. Absolutely do have concern about taking a guy at two like that that I think is raw as a pass rusher. Like, I don't think that's just something that's thrown out there. Because like I said, you can't just draft an athlete and assume he's going to be a great pass rusher. There is something that goes into it. A lot of it has to be, you know, just putting in that work, putting in the time. One thing that we saw Todd Walsh say about, I believe Yannick Ngakwe, is that he was a very detailed player. He wanted to know everything about the position. So guys like that, Trayvon Walker needs a lot of improvement, especially when he's able to kind of find his home. But the versatility is always nice. Nice. Why would the Lions be interested in a guy like Trayvon Walker? Well, I think when you kind of look at where these guys are coming from, Aaron Glenn and also Todd Watch, you look at the type of guys that they have drafted for that spot. They're not the exact same, but there are some similarities. You look at a guy like Cam Jordan. Now, this is a much bigger player. Cam Jordan's coming out. A lot of people are saying 3-4 defensive end, which made sense because the guy was 280 pounds, 6'4", 280, long arms, 35-inch arms, just like Trayvon Walker, 4'7", 640. So maybe not testing out athletically as well, but he was a huge dude. And people are thinking, okay, 3 Three, four defensive end, that's a good role for him. And the Saints have him play defensive end in a 4-3 defense. Like him as a 4-3 strong side defensive end. And that was a guy that was coming out that to have the crazy stats. I mean, look at this. This is for his sack numbers in college. One sack in his first year, four sacks in his second year, six sacks in his third year, five and a half sacks in his fourth season. And when in the NFL, he's had multiple seasons over 10 sacks for the New Orleans Saints, including his third year in the National Football League. That was a guy that was like, well, we don't really know what his pass for shove side is, but he'll be really good on early downs, run downs. He's very lanky. And then you look at a team like the the Jacksonville Jaguars when Todd Walsh was there. I look at a guy like Josh Allen. Josh Allen bulked up for his final year. He went from 230 to about 260 plus pounds in his final year. Another great athlete, like incredible athlete. Six foot four, ran a 46340, 40, 28 bench press reps. He saw his production take off in his final season, able to drop in space. We saw him break up a pass in the end zone. It just kind of showed you the ability that Josh Allen had coming out. That was the seventh pick right in front of the Detroit Lions out of Kentucky. A lot of people viewed him as being like a three, four outside linebacker. And they even asked Todd Walsh when they drafted him, hey, is he going to be able to play three, four outside linebackers that what the defense is going to Todd Walsh like nah I drafted him to be a 4-3 defensive end and his first season in National Football League the guy went for 10 and a half sacks and it was like okay that worked out Todd Walsh knows what he's doing according to Pro Football Reference he had 39 pressures 39 pressures all right, so he took a guy that was like, maybe he's going to be outside linebacker because he's really athletic. And he's like, nope, this is a spot for a 4-3 defensive end. So you get two different kind of different body types, both playing 4-3 defensive end. Heck, even a guy like Trey Hendrickson, third round pick for the Saints, 6'4", 266. His arms are a little bit shorter. Big question, you know, how great he was going to be as a pass rusher at the next level. Nice speed to power move, but it was like, man, maybe a little bit of limited upside there, even though he had good sack numbers coming out. And all of a sudden, this past season, he's with Cincinnati Bengals, signed that four-year $60 million deal. And what do we see Trey Hendrickson do? He's ninth in the National Football League in pass rush win rate. A guy that had questions about his upside there, 23% pass rush win rate. He was ninth in the National Football League for a defensive end. Why would the Lions be interested in a guy like this? I think it actually kind of does make sense. It's starting to grow on me just the logistics of the draft pick, aside from just what I've seen on film. I mean, because this is a guy that's coming off 20 hurries, five sacks. They don't stick out to you. But when you think about Jermaine Johnson, played over 100 more snaps than Trayvon Walker did. Played much more snaps outside the tackle. The guy only had five more hurries than a guy like Trayvon Walker did. And Trayvon Walker is much more raw than Jermaine. That's why people kind of question the upside of a guy like Jermaine. I do not have Jermaine Johnson above Trayvon Walker. I didn't have that in my top five either. So why would this make sense? Well, with what the Lions currently have, one thing is Romeo Quora, not a great run defender. Trayvon Walker with his come in and have great trait will likely be his run defense. Now he was rotational at George, which made sense because of what they had. And he could be a little bit rotational with the Lions. Trayvon Walker could. Yes, is your top pick. And you want him to come in and be all this in your one, but there's nothing wrong with having him be a little bit rotational. You have Charles Harris, so it'll allow him to have some time to develop. Heck, Charles Harris might be able to play some 4-3 Sam linebacker in certain sets, right? But Trayvon Walker could kind of be your strong side defensive end, which you really don't have. I think Charles was good against the run, but 
Trayvon Walker could be dominant against the run first. And then again, it's just about the athletic upside. And while I, I feel a little bit worried about what he is as a pass rusher, I didn't play strong side defensive end. Put Romeo on the weak side, you know, for most plays. Have those two guys out there at the same time. Then your interior is Michael Brockers, Levi, Ali McNeil, probably John Penasini. And you have Charles Harris as well, who on his deal... He'll get a, he'll get rotation, you know, because this is a guy, Trevor Walker, that needs development, and he rotated in college, and we saw him, you know, kind of a little bit like this when he was when he was getting tired. This is not just a draft pick for one year. We know this is a draft pick going forward, and if that's the kind of player that's going to put his head down, just go to work, and he's that kind of very detailed learner, and he just wants to go in here and grind. They've drafted some great athletes, the Saints and the Jags have. This is a better athlete than all of them. And, you know, I look at a guy like Yannick Ngakwe when the Jacksonville Jaguars brought him in. Yannick, when he played defensive end for them, Todd Wash, who loved this fourth through defense he let him play a stand-up role that year he drafted josh allen he's like yeah you're gonna you know he's gonna play fourth through the end he let him play a stand-up role and he a lot of times lined up on the weak side if they could he lined up on a weak side played a stand-up role and on the opposite side they would put a guy like calais campbell right sometimes they put calais campbell on base downs now he's like a dt he's huge like 300 pounds but trayvon walker would then be that and we know the lions want those guys they want to improve their run defense well i feel like they may think that they have some good pass rushers because i think they do romeo struggles with the run charles i thought was good against the run but he can play pass rush downs Julian still hasn't proven a ton against the run and he hasn't always been healthy. So getting a guy like this that can help you against the run, I think it logistically makes sense not only for this year, but also going forward, right? Because Romeo and Charles, they only have two years left on their deals. They're saying top five. If his stock is continuing to rise like that and the Lions love him and they're like, you know what? We didn't get a trade back offer, but we love this guy. Oh, we took him at two because the pass rush just isn't there. But there's also the side of it, which is you draft the player that you love. You don't just draft someone because like, well, he's not as good as him yet. But if you believe you can make him as good, and what we've seen from Todd Walsh is that usually when the guys come in, they have a great first season. They, they come out really hot, even if they weren't supposed to do that. And we saw the Saints do it. And of course, the Rams drafted on top of players on defensive line. So I definitely am kind of on board with, I think they'll go defensive line first. And they look at a guy like George. I think George would make sense, you know, with kind of that bigger defensive end, strong, you know, powerful, can help you against the run. The issue with George is he just hasn't been great against the run. So it's like, okay, you should be an help us there, but he's not great against the run. And his length isn't fantastic either. I like George. I do. I Maybe mean, that's some of the Lions could have on the list. Jermaine Johnson, as I said, upside. The ceiling is a little bit questionable with him. He's got all the measurables. He's a great athlete. He's coming off his best season. I still think he's in the development sort of phase. He didn't play a ton with Georgia. I have Draven Walker above Jermaine Johnson as of this very moment still. Kayvon, while I think on the field, he has a lot of things that you like, and I'll have to go back and watch some of his older stuff to just see if there has been that improvement from year to year, because I know he came out with fresh and dominated, but it's just the off the field stuff, right? Because this is long term. You don't want to draft a guy that's, that's complacent. He's happy that he was a high pick. You want to draft a guy that wants to go win. He wants to all pro. He wants to do this. He has these milestones he wants to achieve. Not a milestone, is great to be drafted, but that's not what you want to draft a guy for is that, hey, I'm glad I finally got drafted. Like, no, you want to be the guy that wants to be an all pro in the National Football League. The relationship between pressure and coverage is very interesting. We know you need both to be successful. And that's actually one thing that was noted when you take a look at the New Orleans Saints. If you look at the Saints in the past, they've consistently had a pretty good pass rush uh, for the last like four or five years, they could five, six years. They've had a good pass rush, but they haven't always had the sack production. You know, for the, for a second there, it was, you know, like 2016, a lot of quarterback hits, but the sacks weren't lining up. And again, coverage, I think plays a lot into that because maybe you're showing that you can get after your quarterback with all the quarterback hits, but you're not necessarily making plays in the back end. You're not forcing them to hold on to the football. That really changed with the 2017 NFL draft where the New Orleans Saints drafted a guy named Marcus Williams out of Utah, who for his past two seasons had five interceptions each, 11 in his total, 11 in three seasons at Utah. They drafted that guy in round number two. He came in as a ball hawk, a guy that was willing to tackle. You know, he had a lot of run tackles in his college career, but he was never very great at not didn't bring a lot of power to it. And I don't even think now he's a great run defender in terms of strictly versatility, but he could play single high. He can cover a tons of field. He has great range and he's a ball hawking back in safety. And that's what he's been since he's joined the league and once they did that their sack rates just skyrocketed because they had that guy in the back end who was kind of that ball hawk but they've always invested in that they had Malcolm Jenkins who they signed to a four-year 32 million dollar deal now he has retired uh good luck going forward Malcolm Jenkins had Von Bell who I believe was also a second round pick that's one position in free agency where we have not seen the Lions address and when you, I look at free agency for safety PJ Williams is now not available which is okay when you look at the safety free agency market honestly from not going extremely deep into it, it doesn't look that great right now where maybe there's not a lot of options out there just for the lines to sign. There just doesn't seem to be. Tracy Walker back is awesome, but even a guy like Terrell Edmonds. I like Terrell Edmonds. But for Pittsburgh, he was kind of more of a, a box, slot, downhill, 
you know, he was kind of more of that type of safety that could play coverage, man coverage, tight ends. I would like to have him, but he may be looking for a multi-year deal. He's still a young player, great athlete, good build. Free agency market is kind of late right now, especially if you're looking for a young guy. Even on a prove-it deal, it's just kind of light with what's available. Lines could still add there, but it's just light. You know, and you don't just sign someone, just say you sign someone, because that doesn't really mean you feel depth if you don't believe in the guy. So I think for the draft, we know the Lions are going to address this. The question is, is it a Kyle Hamilton with the top pick? And while I do think he is relatively high on the Lions board, the so more I dive into this, I think they would prioritize the pass rush before they would prioritize the safety just based on the history of the Saints and the Rams mid-round safeties they found tons of success now safeties are actually one of the safest draft picks historically oh that sounds funny like safety safetyists and especially in the first round they're pretty darn safe never really go that high like top five safeties wasn't very normal like that kind of thing isn't super normal in comparison to d-line which is not extremely safe the alignments bust they have the they have the highest bust to pro bowl differential and this was a study done a few years back but they had the highest bust to pro bowl differential of any position national football league that's including quarterback minus 13.7 percent which is not good defensive line stuff to hit in early rounds but i would think that would be the position just based on the history here and then safety would be that round two possibly end of round one round three type of pick and it could be multiple players that the lions look to grab here but i think the more i think about it and much as i like kyle hamilton you know i still have him as my one safety for sure I think what the Lions they were looking for, and, he, and look, this guy can ball hawk, right? The guy literally allowed a one pass rating in his fur Heshman season with Notre Dame, just playing on sub downs. It's insane. He had four interceptions. He's a ball hawk, but when he hit round two, round three, I think the Lions would be looking for a ball hawking type of safety. I think that's what they'd be looking for. Guy that can cover a pretty good amount of field, play single hot they need to, but he still has to have enough versatility. That way he can slide down. You know, you can't have him as a liability, I don't think, because you don't want Tracy Walker always playing down low. But to me, Tracy Walker is a split cover safety that does a lot of his best work coming downhill playing underneath the zone and that's kind of similar to Terrell Edmonds which is why the Lions may not love that pairing together but a ball hawking type of safety specifically for split coverage by the way Ronnie Harrison he was with Jacksonville and Cleveland he also spent time with Jacksonville they drafted him in round three when Todd Walsh was there so maybe a guy like that's interesting to them but a ball hawking type of safety I think of guys like Veron McKinley who we're talking all about with Kayvon I'm pretty sure McKinley also went through his pro day stuff at Oregon maybe not but I'm pretty sure at least maybe he was there Veron McKinley is interesting a little bit undersized, but definitely a ball hawk at Oregon. 11 total career interceptions at his time with Oregon. He's the type of player that can make a lot of plays on the football. And I have him pretty high on my safety list. Not top five, but I have him pretty high on my safety list. Of course, Jaquan Brisker to me comes to mind. I think he's a very well-rounded. Yeah, he's going to come down and hit, which is going to be nice because he can kind of do that as well. But I also really do like him in coverage. I think he's great in man coverage. Zone coverage, I don't think it's always perfect, but I think he's pretty darn good here. And he's improving at every year in terms of being a ball hawk you know kirby joseph with, with with illinois things need work there with kirby joseph that type of safety is what they'd be looking for if they're gonna hit the safety mark in the mid round i think that's more what they look for enough versatility but at the same time guy that's built for split coverage like a kirby joseph who did that with illinois like a Verone mckinley who kind of did that with oregon they played a lot of cover three there you know and he did that underneath as well even at his size those kind of guys i think the lions will be interested in when it comes to the safety position well when i look at corner first thing that stuck out you know you want to have that top corner jerry jacobs last season according to player profiler and we know he was good according to pff he was good statistically he he just didn't have a ton of interceptions but interceptions really sway pass rating that's the thing you look at a guy like amani he a lot of low pass rating but alani was not Amani to me was not better in terms of coverage and separation allowed and catch rate and those kind of things as Jacobs was Amani just had a couple more interceptions and sometimes it's luck of the ball that play he was burned against Cleveland and it fell in his lap that's an interception drops his pass rating doesn't mean he really played coverage well it just drops his pass rating Jerry Jacobs according to player profiler was given a plus 22.7 which means he was number five in the National Football League in coverage rating. Number five for all cornerbacks in the National Football League. That was above Jalen Ramsey. That's impressive. That takes in that takes in consideration separation average allowed per route. His was at 1.3 yards, number 10 in the National Football League. That really doesn't shock me. If you watch him, he's a very physical corner. He doesn't give much airspace. I noticed that as soon as the first game he played against Minnesota, he gives like no airspace. Really nice run defender as well. When we say, hey, well, Jacobs could be the top corner. Yeah, he may not have that background of I was around one pick, four years, $80 million. But he also performed like a guy that could be a top, you know, cornerback. And the thing is, he didn't have good pass rush last year. It was worse than it was in 2020. It's not like he had a good pass rush. No, he didn't play every game. He's coming off an injury, so you have to keep that in mind. But that is very impressive for Jacobs. Then you have Iffy. The only other guy on this team that graded positively in coverage rating was Iffy, a plus 2.9 coverage rating. 
we just didn't see him very much. It was just such a small sample size. Uh, but you definitely saw the improvements from when he got back from his injury versus before he went out. Not playing terrible before the injury. He was doing okay for us. It was just he got injured trying to track down Devontae Adams, but then he came back last week, got his revenge, had a beautiful pass breakup on the best route runner, they tell us, in the National Football League. Amani was given a negative 0.3, which would rank him 68th in the NFL in coverage rating, and 1.6 average yards of separation. A lot of guys were kind of in that range, but negative 0.3. Now, I definitely think Amani, he was he got better last year as the year went on. I mean, the, the interceptions are important because the Lions haven't gotten many of those, and they need to continue to get those. So I like Amani. I do. I'm just saying I think Jerry Jacobs was the better coverage guy last season. Amani's going into the final year of his contract, so hopefully he can get up. We don't have anything on Jeff Okuda because he didn't play last season. We don't have any production to look at there. They don't have any ratings. A.J. Parker graded out the worst negative 19.4 which puts him at 89th in the NFL and 1.9 yards on average for sep for separation he played in the slot didn't play every game but the numbers aren't great there and honestly that's not super surprising because they're UDFA I mean hey the, the Rams they they know what it's like to have UDFAs play big roles even the Saints a little bit too like a Ken Crawley but the Rams know what it's like to have UDFAs play big roles this has Troy Hill the next big one would be the Mike Hughes edition unfortunately they don't have his for some reason but last season was his best coverage year he allowed a sub 60% completion percentage PFF loved him they gave him nearly 80 coverage grade which is outstanding he was really nice in coverage the only thing that knocked him down was touchdowns i would have loved to see where he ranked amongst this i would assume it's pretty well with kansas city came back on a really good season and we know with this slot outside background he can push a guy like aj parker he can play in nickel sets he plays physical just like uh jerry jacobs which can really kind of close off the separation that is a former first round pick and then you have uh will harris in there as well i have his because they just had his for the safety side of things even though they play corner i would assume it wasn't very good so where would the lions dress corner I think the Detroit Lions, the more I look at it, I think they could hit one mid to late round. I just don't see it being a top pick. I don't see it being a top pick. Having Okuda come back, which I still think they like. He's just coming off the injury, which is concerning. Jacobs played outstanding last season, as long as they feel good about his recovery. Amani, much improved from last year's. If he showed a lot of promise, the third round pick, A.J. Parker, yeah, he was a rookie, but he'll get pushed by Mike Hughes. I don't think they would go super high at corner because, first off, limited spots, and I think everybody I just said is going to make the team next season. I just think they're all locks to make the team uh, with Will Harris maybe being a little bit on the outs, but no, I still think Will Harris makes the team. So I think all those guys are making it, which means I think mid to late round could make sense. You know, maybe if they find someone around five that they like or around maybe even around three at the end of round three that they like, depending on how the draft board goes something like that or maybe just another UDFA because clearly one of the UDFAs was a complete diamond in Jerry Jacobs so I could see them doing something like that I just don't see it being the high pick like a sauce Gardner just doesn't seem to make sense for this season right you get the defensive line you know once that's dominant you get a guy like Jalen Ramsey in there something like that he's an outstanding quarterback but where the lines are at Okuda to me it's a prove it year coming off injury he's got to stay healthy and he's got to prove it this season to be a long-term piece for the Lions uh you know but where if he's at I think he's going to see a much bigger role it just doesn't feel like the right year to go top cornerback Look at the off-ball linebacker's position. I won't take too much time to talk about this. Just touched on it pretty briefly here. The Lions do have a lot of guys under contract currently going into next season at the linebacker position. Chris Board, Jared Davis, uh, Josh Woods, Derek Barnes, Alex Anzalone, Sean Deion Hamilton, Curtis Bolton, Devontae Beckett, I believe Anthony Pittman. You know, now those two guys, uh, they're not in the top 51 cutoff. But there's a lot of players that are under contract for next season. But with pretty much every single deal, there's like no locks. The only two that feel close to being locks here and one, Derek Barnes, he'll bank the team. But then also Alex Anzalone, just based on how much he's getting paid. He's got a $2.1 million cap hit. If he was cut, $1.75 million dead cap. So he feels like the closest thing to a lock out of all those guys. But aside from that, I mean, really any of them can be moved. Jared Davis, when you look at his contract, basically the guy could be cut and it doesn't hurt the Lions at all. Really on the league minimum for the Detroit Lions. Chris Board has a $1.9 million cap hit with a $1.1 million dead cap if he was cut this season. Uh, he's also on a winner deal. Davis is on a winner deal. Josh Woods was on a, is now on a winner deal. $1.5 million cap hit with seven hundred fifty k in dead cap if he was cut. Barnes is a rookie deal. Alex Anzalone is on the one-year deal. Shawty and Hamill's on a cheap one-year deal. Curtis Bolt like there are really no locks here i would say the two closest things feel like alex and zaloni if i had to do an early prediction i would say out of those guys alex Derek barnes josh woods and chris board could potentially take each other's spot but i can see both of them making the team and then maybe davis and sean Deon hamilton the lines are going to address it in the draft 
It won't be with the first pick in the draft, though. The Lions aren't first pick, will not be going to the linebacker position. If as a whole, the focus will be on the defensive line first when you're talking about the front seven. You know, the linebackers can be a little bit overshadowed by what the front seven is, but we've looked at this before. When you look at kind of the average draft position, they've taken, the Rams have drafted one very high linebacker in the past. They drafted him at pick number 30, Alec Ogletree, last of four years, and he was out of LA. Did not work well for them. That's not to say that you can't do it. I just think it's going to be overshadowed by the defense line. That's the first focus is stack up this defensive line make sure that's dominant for the front seven and then behind that I think the Lions are looking for is what they've told us they're looking for guys to get downhill I think they like guys with good length you know with kind of that mentality to kind of split your chin open like a Davis but also maybe a guy that could help in coverage you know I think they could be looking for sure for some outside linebacker help at least some competition when you look at the wheel linebacker position the weak side guy that could help drop into coverage I think Alex could fill into that role right now you could add competition for that for those four three base sets and then maybe a Sam backer, you know, I think Jared, da I think Davis might be in the conversation for that. I think a guy like Josh Woods would kind of be in the conversation to play that type of role. Now you look at Chris Board, I think he'll be competing for a will linebacker position as well, because to me, Chris Board playing on only sub downs, basically with the Baltimore Ravens playing on third downs, he'd either blitz or drop into coverage. He's a former safety. He'll compete for that kind of role. I think when you talk about the draft, I think outside linebacker would be a position they look to add. They said Derek Barnes was going to be the mic when they drafted him. So just going off of that, I think they're going to want an outside linebacker competition. I think Will would make sense. You know, someone that can help in coverage, play some man coverage, drop in his zone, but specifically a guy that is not afraid to blitz. You know, get out there on third down because they love their zero coverage and just blitz. Uh, and they can also do the same thing with the Sam. Just get an outside linebacker that can help in that area. And I could see them drafting two. I could see them drafting two. Definitely for sure one. Maybe a second one, depending on how the board goes. If you go based on what the Saints have done in the past, you look at a DeMar you look at a Demario Davis, who was a mid-round pick. You look at a Zach Bond, who was a mid-round pick. Alex and Zaloni, who was a mid-round pick, it would seem like that's probably where the range is going to be. You know, pick 66, pick 97, you know, pick... 34 at the highest, I would think. You know, if they fell in love with a guy like N'Kobe Dean because he is a heavy blitzer, I know they're going to like that. Yeah, he's a little undersized, but he is a very heavy blitzer. He can play man coverage. I don't think it'll be their biggest focus. I mean, I think, if anything, the Lions may kind of double up on safety and maybe just hit one or two linebackers, but really focus on defensive line, building the trenches, and then maybe come back and hit safety twice. You know, you get a safety to start with Tracy Walker, get kind of that ball hawk in the back end, then maybe even grab another one for some of the 4 2 5 sets defensively maybe late just for competition or maybe instead of a second safety it's a cornerback you know something like that I could see it because I think they view Will Harris as their version of a PJ Williams who is going into his final year of his contract by the way Jalen Elliott's not in the top 51 cutoff I do like CJ Moore so I like that we have him you know kind of as if you draft someone, he'd be the four safety at that point behind Will Harris saying that he's still a safety. So that opens up the door for another safety potentially draft pick or another cornerback. But I think you get a couple of secondary pieces. You got to get the one starter in there for sure. I do like CJ Moore. I think they think Will Harris is kind of their version of PJ Williams. He's more athletic PJ Williams. Aaron Glenn told us guy that can play every spot defensively, very smart. He could play, you know, as your third safety, or he could also, you know, go play cornerback if you needed him to. So I think, you know, linebacker will be something they address. But I definitely, I don't think it's going to be their biggest focus. It may get overlooked a little bit. But I do think just based on what the Saints have done, they, they know they want help at linebacker. I think they do. And that's why they signed so many short deals. They'll let everybody compete. But if they don't make the team, these guys can easily be cut. So for me, one linebacker will be drafted, likely mid-rounds. An impossible second one could be thrown in there. Look for a guy that likes to get downhill, probably has good length, and maybe can help us in coverage a little bit. This video, I really just want to talk about where I think the advanced stats time to tell where the Lions may be looking to address and add some help. Clearly, the run defense needs to be better. We definitely need pass rush help. I think when you look at the history of a lot of these teams it's it seems like that will probably be the direction that they go i still have a lot of questions in general so maybe this answers some maybe it just raised more questions i don't know what this video did for you but for me it helped me find a lot more stats to look at and it kind of gave me a, a just another refresher a new way of thinking about it as we get closer to this year's draft if you took anything cool away from this video let me know down in the comments below and until next time thank you for watching and i'm out